Welcome to the 10th and final module of the ICWA Education Series presented by the Nebraska Court Improvement Project in collaboration with the Nebraska Indian Child Welfare Coalition. Today we will learn about how tribes can be involved in a case by discussing the role of ICWA specialist and other tribal representatives, intervention, and tribal court. We will wrap up this final module by administering the same test you took at the very beginning of, of this education series. Tribes and tribal representatives can be involved in ICWA proceedings in a myriad of ways, ranging from no tribal involvement to intervention and transfer. The ICWA guarantees that representatives from the Indian Child's tribe or tribes have the right to fully participate in every court proceeding held under the Act. It is important to remember that compliance with the ICWA is mandatory regardless of the level of tribal involvement. The Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services Division of Children and Family Services has a designated tribal program team that is responsible for the provision of policy, training, and technical assistance with compliance with the ICWA. Let's hear how this team helps to facilitate communication with tribal representatives and also the ways in which some of the Nebraska tribes are involved in cases. We have built really good relationships with a lot of the tribal ICWA specialists. So sometimes when case managers aren't able to get a hold of somebody with the Ogallala tribe, our team can spend a little more time to reach out to those workers and help make those connections. Tribes that are typically most involved in our ICWA cases in this area are the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska and the Omaha Tribe. We do have pretty regular staffings with them. Um, the The Ponca Tribe of Nebraska has a representative at usually almost every um, home visit, visit with the foster parent, and court hearing. Um, the Omaha Tribe of Nebraska is present at pretty much every court hearing. Um, on the other hand, the Rosebud and the Ogallala, they do stay in contact with the department, like through the tribal program team, and they do receive like the list of their children that are in care. Um, but we may not hear from them for several months. And uh, like the Rosebud Sioux tribe, they will participate potentially in like a termination parental rights trial or different pieces or like mediations for those types of things. But we won't necessarily hear from them um, on regular like day to day um, pieces. And I think a lot of that goes back to one, the Ponca tribe and the Omaha tribe are pretty local. So um, they're located here in Nebraska. They're familiar with all of how Nebraska works. Um, and they have a lot easier access to like the workers and the court system and things like that. Um, and then caseloads also, both with the Rosebud and the Ogallala, they have rather large caseloads for their ICWA departments. And we need to remember that for all of our tribes, they're serving um, youth and families that are tribal members throughout the country. Um, so not just in Nebraska, not even just in our time zone, but they may have court hearings um, until like 7 p.m. Central Time because it's still five o'clock or four o'clock on the West Coast. Involvement from all of the different tribes that we work with can also vary because the size of the departments varies. Mm -hmm. So whereas the Ponca tribe might have four or five workers available to help staff on a case, to help attend meetings, to help uh, work through cultural plans, places such as Ogallala and Rosebud have one ICWA worker and have over 300 cases nationwide. And that's cases, not children. <laughs> so if each of the, if they have to attend in-person hearings for all of those cases, it's almost impossible. <laughs> it is impossible. Yeah. As mentioned previously, tribes can choose to be involved in a state child welfare proceeding in a variety of ways. One of which is by intervening in the case. In any state court proceeding for the foster care placement of or termination of parental rights to an Indian child, the Indian custodian of the child and the child's tribe or tribes shall have a right to intervene at any point in the proceeding, regardless of whether the intervening party is represented by legal counsel. 
representatives from the Indian child's tribe or tribes have the right to fully participate in every court proceeding held under the act. Once a tribe intervenes in a case, they are considered a party and are entitled to the same rights, notice, and opportunity to be heard as any other party in the case. I think, for one thing, you know, they're if, if they've intervened in the case, they're a party, and um, making sure that you're sending them all the pleadings and documents, you know, I always try to include on emails, um, send my exhibits if I'm, you know, offering a guardian ad litem report or ensure that they've received the court report, because I think sometimes that's an afterthought, and then they'll appear at a hearing and don't have everything, I mean, how could you possibly be adequately prepared if you mm -hmm. haven't had a chance to receive so things, so that's, um, you know, one thing that comes to mind. Um, that I've seen that I think we could do a better job of. Sometimes a tribe will intervene in a case, but then opt not to appear at a hearing, perhaps due to geographical or scheduling limitations. In other circumstances, a tribe may choose to appear at every hearing. The level of participation and involvement of the tribe post-intervention is at the tribe's discretion. As one tribe, there may be very reasonable reasons why they're not involved in uh -huh. our case or not able to communicate. It could be a lack of resources, funding, all these other things, and another tribe is able to. It doesn't mean one tribe cares more about right. a child, cares less about a child, um, or it, and can be involved. Mm -hmm. I, I just love it, though, when they can be involved, so right. I wish we were able to do that more often because they're able to provide beyond that family who's experiencing crisis, they're able to provide so much more context into the culture of the tribe that even if, as a guardian ad litem, we go on their website and research, it just doesn't give us the same kind of context as if that an actual employee or family member of that tribe could give, give to us. it is important to note that a tribe is not required to be represented by council in order to participate in the court process. So you don't need to be a lawyer um, from the tribe in order to file documents, um, file motions, file orders uh, with the court. It, it can be representative from the tribe. We give everyone from the tribe who appears the chance to speak, whether that's a case manager from the tribe, a tribal representative. Some tribes hire lawyers, and obviously they're entitled to speak as well, but if, if you um, want to come to court by Zoom, that's fine. We'll allow for that because a lot of the tribes aren't local and it's a hardship for them to travel to Omaha. So luckily, the, the good thing about the pandemic is it gave us the technology to participate by Zoom. Um, so we can offer that for the tribe to increase participation. And I, I have seen that that does help. Having um, hearings on Zoom has enabled tribes to participate more frequently. so high, feeling free, remember me. While a tribe is not required to be represented by council, some tribes do have ICWA-specific attorneys able to represent their position in a child welfare case. Let's listen to Alexis Zendayas, the Indian child welfare attorney for the Omaha tribe of Nebraska. Yeah, I think the Omaha tribe is... <laughs> is unique out of the tribes here in Nebraska. I believe I'm the only in-house Indian Child Welfare Act attorney. Um, I work with one other person, our ICWA specialist, um, and our ICWA specialist, what he does is he receives the notices and the inquiries for um, eligibility and enrollment. He runs those through our enrollment director 
and sends out whether or not they are eligible or ineligible for enrollment through our tribe. What I do is as soon as he finds out their eligibility, if they are eligible or if they are enrolled, um, I do all of the legal work and so I intervene, I do all of our transfers, I appear in court for dispositions, review hearings, permanency hearings, transfer hearings. I also attend all of the staffings or family team meetings um, for the various jurisdictions and cases that um, the Omaha's are intervened in. Now that we've learned about ways in which a tribe can be involved in a state court proceeding, let's learn a little more about tribal court. A tribal court can exercise exclusive jurisdiction in two situations. When the Indian child resides or is domiciled within a reservation, and two, when the Indian child is a ward of tribal court. When a tribal court has exclusive jurisdiction, that means no other court has the authority to hear the case. There are times in which a case might start out in a state court, but subsequently be transferred to a tribal court. Under Nebraska Revised Statute 43-1504, Sub 2, in any state court proceeding for the foster care placement of or termination of parental rights to an Indian child, the court shall transfer the proceeding to the jurisdiction of the primary tribe. Whenever a parent or tribe seeks to transfer the case to tribal court, it is presumptively in the best interests of the Indian child to transfer the case to the jurisdiction of the Indian tribe. There are three situations in which a state court can decline to transfer to tribal court. Those include 1. The parent or Indian custodian objects to the transfer. 2. The child's tribe declines to accept the transfer. Or 3. Good cause exists for denying the transfer. Let's dive into what might constitute good cause to deny transfer. While the ICWA and the NICWA do not define good cause, the federal regulations provide us some helpful guidance. In determining whether good cause exists, the court must not consider 1. Whether the foster care or termination of parental rights proceeding is at an advanced stage if the Indian child's parent, Indian custodian, or tribe did not receive notice of the child custody proceedings until an advanced stage. Two, whether there have been prior proceedings involving the child for which no petition to transfer was filed. Three, whether transfer could affect the placement of the child. Four, the Indian child's cultural connections with the tribe or its reservation. Or five, socioeconomic conditions or any negative perception of tribal or BIA social services or judicial systems. Our Nebraska Supreme Court has discussed the good cause exception to transfer in a few notable cases. Full case citations can be found at the end of the module. In 2016, Nebraska Supreme Court case in re-interest of Tavian B., the court found that the case being at an advanced stage was not a valid basis for finding good cause to deny a motion to transfer jurisdiction to a tribal court. In its opinion, the court referenced the federal guidelines, specifically noting that the guidelines help us to understand that there may be valid reasons for waiting to transfer a proceeding until it reaches an advanced stage. A tribe might decline to intervene during foster care placement proceedings when the goal is reunification with the parents, whereas the tribe would be more likely concerned with removal of Indian children in termination proceedings. The BIA guidelines note that the denial of motions to transfer because a proceeding is at an advanced stage undermines the presumption of tribal jurisdiction over proceedings involving Indian children not residing or domiciled on the reservation. The court noted that the ICWA seeks to protect not only the rights of the Indian child as an Indian, but also the rights of Indian communities and tribes in retaining Indian children. A second Nebraska Supreme Court case in re-interest of Xylena R. provides us with some additional guidance. In that case, the Supreme Court made clear that the best interests of the Indian child should not be a factor in, in resolving the issue of whether there is good cause to deny a motion to transfer a case from state court to tribal court. In making this determination, the court stated, quote, The reality is that both a juvenile court applying Nebraska law and a tribal court proceeding under ICWA must act in the interest of an Indian child over whom they have jurisdiction. 
the question before a state court considering a motion to transfer to tribal court is simply which tribunal should make that decision. Permitting a state court to deny a motion to transfer based upon its perception of the best interests of the child undermines the federal policy established by ICWA in ensuring that, quote, Indian children welfare determinations are not based on, quote unquote, a white middle class standard, which in many cases forecloses placement with an Indian family, end quote. The final case we will mention is a 2014 Nebraska Court of Appeals case in reinterest of Jaden D., which further clarified that at a hearing on a motion to transfer a proceeding to tribal court, the party opposing the transfer has the burden of establishing that good cause not to transfer exists. Let's hear from Pat Carraher, who was involved in that appeal. So my second appeal uh, involved a motion to transfer to tribal court. I represented the parent and I filed a motion to transfer the case to tribal court. And I knew that the law was that once the parent requested that or the tribe requested that, that the burden shifts to any other party to show good cause why it should not transfer. So I didn't feel like I had to present a lot of evidence. So we had a hearing and it was a very short hearing because I didn't think I had to put on much evidence and no other party put on much evidence and the judge overruled my motion, uh, but I, I appealed because I felt like they didn't meet their burden. You know, it was a 10 minute hearing, there was a 15 page bill of exceptions, and I thought that all favored me because that showed no one else met their burden of proving why it should not transfer. Uh, and the Court of Appeals did agree with that and reversed the judge. Transfer of jurisdiction is a transfer of jurisdiction. Um, it is a competent jurisdiction, it is a court of competent jurisdiction, and any concerns or worries that you may have about this child, the tribe's court also shares worries about this child. I think it is a common misconception by not only court and other attorneys, but I think by by parents as well that that they communicate to their to their attorneys and so it's just this cyclical incel of misinformation that their case will be dismissed immediately in tribal court that is not the case if we transfer a case it goes through a very similar process we do initial appearance for our tribal court, they go through disposition, review hearings, permanency hearings. They have to follow judges' orders. They work with our tribal children and family services department, which is the equivalent of the Department of Health and Human Service. So when a when a case gets transferred from state court to tribal court, there is also no lapse in due process. There's no lapse in any rights that the child may have or that the parents may have. They have to go through that court process, but they go through that court process in tribal court on the reservation and in, in a location and in a jurisdiction where maybe they feel more comfortable and the judge is going to potentially give them a little more time because tri tribes, and I believe we say this in all of our QEW testimony and affidavits, that we do not believe in termination of parental rights. We do, however, believe that that child deserves permanency. If it takes a little bit longer to get there, then that's what we'll do. But at the end of the day, that child deserves permanency. Um, it's just a different court of competence. It's, it's, just, it's just a different uh, court of competent jurisdiction. Sun comes up in the morning sky, there I will be, there 
go so high, feeling free. Remembering down the road, hand in hand, you and